Great, welcome everyone. So it's the um, it's the um, low cost version of Honor available today. So today uh, today we have a great lecture. Actually, it's kind of funny when uh, Honor asked me to do a lecture. Um, I am very sure he would like to do this lecture because it's a fun lecture to give. I'm not very sure if you will enjoy it as much as I do. I sure hope so, but I'll do my best. Uh, it's fun. So we are going to talk about memory. And uh, before we start, uh, first of all, the reading uh, for today and for tomorrow. Uh, so Harrison Harris chapter 8 is uh, mostly about that. You should probably also refresh chapter 3.5. There is also a bunch of reading um, because uh, this is uh, one of the most important parts and, and something that affects the computer performance a lot. And it's a very fun story. You know, it starts with a little problem, then we find a solution for it, then we try to make it better, then there are new problems, and we try to be more inventive and more inventive. And for the last 40 years, we've been playing all kinds of games. And you realize how much more creative we can get once we are uh, stuck with a problem. And uh, so actually, when you look at the computing system, you have these uh, several components. Some of you are missing, right? I mean, 458, I think. Oh, there are some people on the other. I, I see like four people there. OK. <laughs> Why are they there? OK. Uh, computing system has these three uh, components. And this comes from the earliest days uh, with von Neumann computing. So you compute, you com uh, communicate, and you have some storage memory. And uh, we are all aware of these things. So uh, we are going to cover all these things. So when you are uh, looking at it, you have some data path. So this data path is responsible for doing your operations, additions, multiplications, XORs, what have you. Then there is a control. It's sequencing. You want to order your operations one after another so that they you know, come together and do something meaningful. And then while you are doing this, you are continuously exchanging information from the memory. You are uh, not only writing and reading data, you also get uh, the program, the thing that tells you in what sequence you should, um, you should uh, execute your program, also from the memory. In addition to this, a computer working on its own, doing some calculations, reading and writing from the memory, is boring. Why? You have to know what this computer is doing. You have to give him some job to do give him some input, and afterwards, hopefully, it does something useful, so you can also get something else. So that's the last component, the input-output component. Today, we are going to look at the memory, and actually, as a, don't worry, don't worry, no stress, no stress. <laughs> easy, easy. I don't want to have him in a heart attack, you know? <laughs> OK, actually, as a computer scientist, this is the way that you want to have of memory. There is some memory. I store things. I load from it. And frankly speaking, this is all you want to care. Anything else, you care maybe because of the exam, you know, so that you do well in this exam. But we discussed in the beginning also, uh, having a better understanding of what lies underneath is going to help you be a better computer scientist because you will, you will understand what kind of tricks we ended up playing so that this memory does what it is supposed to do. There is another thing as a programmer. You all have different computers. I see in front of you several laptops. And uh, at home, you have computers. I'm an old person. You can imagine I have like this very, very old looking thing in my home. They all have different types of memories, different capabilities. And um, it's actually interesting. You know, when you write a program, uh, you, you start writing your program, whatever, and then you're not thinking, my god, do I know how much memory this computer has which is going to execute my program? There are some cases where there might be a certain scientific application where you need to define large arrays, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They say, I need at least this much. But you're not writing a different program depending on um, the target computer. It's not like you go when you're downloading 
um, whatever, Skype for eight gigabyte memory or Skype for 32 gigabyte memory. So actually what the programmer sees is uh, what we would call a virtual memory. And you can assume that this memory is practically infinite. Uh, there is a limit to it or you know, certain programs will say only 48 bit addressing, 50 bit addressing, whatever, but it's quite a large memory and maybe it has nothing to do with the uh, physical capabilities of your uh, system. So in the reality, uh, you have a physical memory that is made out of transistors. You will see what they look like. And uh, what is a programmer you are accessing is this uh, physical memory, but we are putting an interface in between that. So there is a virtual memory. It is mapped to a real physical memory. And we are the system, the hardware um, that is, is uh, is available in, in part in hardware, in part in the operating system that maps these virtual addresses to real physical addresses that we'll, we'll use uh, when building our memory. So this is the, the best advantage of it is that the programmer does not need to know anything about the physical size of the memory. They can program and manage it. It's being done. The, all these conversions are being done in the back. And so life is very easy for the programmer. You don't care. Hopefully, someone in the back is taking care of it. And this is why they hire uh, specialists to, to build your operating systems, to build you uh, hardware systems that does that. So it's a classical uh, example of dividing uh, a, a trade-off between you know, how much the programmer needs to know about the mi microarchitecture uh, that's lying behind. So. Um, when you have a lot of memory and you, you realize there's a physical memory you can fit into your device, and maybe you can extend this memory by even other methods, and a lot of uh, the, the uh, physical memory, the, the ROM that you have in your system, would have a backing storage. In, in most cases, this is a disk. Uh, in, it's called a disk because there were rotating things in it. Uh, that was before we had uh, the solid state drives, so the hard disks actually had rotating things. We call them hard disks as opposed to flexible tapes. And uh, these days, probably the name is a bit strange. I also realized somebody told me that whenever you open Word or something else, there is this icon for save. For me, it's very natural. But I realize most of you have not seen a three, three and a half inch floppy disk. Now you're looking at me like that. It doesn't make any sense for you. I mean, what, why is the icon such a strange shape, right? Never thought about that? No. Okay. I lost a bit. Yeah, now you're looking at go open an editor, look at the save icon. It's a strange thing. You have never held it in your hands. Who has, who has had a three and a half? Where do you get these things? Sorry? Where, where? Where do you see three and a half inch disks? You are like a secret society of three and a half inch disk users? <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, I take it back. I take it back. So hard disks can be your backup storage. So at this time, um, uh, we will ignore the virtual physical indirection. We will just talk about physical memories. If we have time tomorrow, this means that if I you know, stick to the script and uh, actually go through the slides properly, uh, we will also have time to talk about this part, how the uh, virtual to physical memory mapping is done. So let's look at an ideal uh, system. We are going to come back to this. This is our ideal system. In the middle, we have our pipeline, the instruction uh, executor. So we tell him what to do, and the, the real operation is being done there. There must be a supply of instructions so that once it's done with one instruction, the next one comes, and the next one, then the next one. And these instructions execute on data, so there needs to be also a, um, a bucket that is able to supply this execution unit with enough data, or the other way around, should also absorb all the data produced by it so that the program can go. So if it is an ideal case, what you want it to do is, first of all, this pipeline has no issues with stalling. There are no 
Um, you don't have to wait for anything. There are no hazards, no data hazards, no write hazards. There's a perfect uh, data flow. Data is there whenever you need it. Data is taken away whenever you need it. There is no problems with the interconnects. There is no problems accessing any data anywhere. There is enough functional units, no matter what you want to calculate, there magically is something that is able to do that calculation all within the same time. And uh, computation doesn't take any time, okay? Um, this is sort of a sarcastic slide, so none of this is happening, okay? It's just that we are jealous and we wish that we would have these things so that our life was much better. Now, let's look at this part, the instruction supply. We want that no matter what, any time you want an instruction, the instruction magically comes. So this means zero latency access. We want an instruction, we tell him, give me the next one, it's there. It's an infinite capacity. I can have a program, no matter how large it is, it's still working at the same thing, and it has zero cost. It doesn't matter how large it is, how fast it is, I'm not paying for it, and there's a perfect control flow. Um, you know, if, if something uh, changes, it doesn't have any penalties. The same for the data, it has zero latency access, infinite capacity, infinite bandwidth, zero cost. So this is where we are uh, trying to get to. Now, um, you can all tell that this is the execution units and these are the memories that we were seeing in our system. We had a couple of them. I tried to draw, a, I wanted to keep it a bit simple. People already pointed out what kind of problems I had in this drawing. Just bear with me, right? This is a single cycle processor, very simplified, a lot of mistakes, but the basic parts are there. So we have a program counter, that program counter generates an address, goes into an instruction memory, you fetch some, the instruction that you want to execute, it's decoded, maybe you use some registers, those are fetched, maybe they compute something, the result is written back, maybe whatever is here is an address, that uh, goes to a data memory, you fetch something, and maybe you write it back. And all of this, there is some control logic, there's also a next state calculation for the program counter, but things look like this. So in this example uh, that we have, this is the one that is supplying us the instructions. Uh, this is the one where we have the data communication, and all the rest is more or less uh, what we call the execution pipeline. And, um, we do this a lot in teaching, uh, electronics and in computer science apparently as well. We continuously lie to you. Okay, we explain this and everything looks very nice and simple, and then we come into it and explain, yeah, you know it's like this, but, and then we start making exceptions and explain more what the problems are and continuously make the problem more complex. So today is one of those examples, because remember we were telling you that this is a single cycle processor, what, what was single cycle? What was it doing within a single cycle? Yeah? It finishes executing one instruction. So it fetches an instruction, it decodes, tries to understand what an instruction tells you, it executes it, so whatever it is, he does it, and then he makes another memory access or writes it back. This is all done within one clock cycle, that's your one step of operation. And this works very well. Uh, what's your goal? What do you want from this processor? What's your ideal goal? If you remember, we had in the slide something ideal. You want this thing to be? I want this lecture to be over. <laughs> fast? Who wants a fast computer? Yeah, I'm looking at the rest. What's your wish? Tell me your darkest desires about the processor. Okay, the way to make it fast is to make sure that all these things can execute, uh, can, can work fast. Now today we are going to realize that accessing these memories is not going to be so easy. So uh, now we want to go to, uh, to have a quick overview of how memories are organized. And for this, I'm going to make a, uh, where is my watch? Yeah, 10 minute excursion into the abstraction levels that we talked at the very, very beginning of the uh, lecture. So we were saying that 
Uh, to deal with complexity, we use these abstraction layers. I had them actually uh, listed horizontally. Now I have them here. So we may start with an idea. We may start with an idea. And in this case, I have one idea that I, I think should be very um, familiar these days. It's very hyped up. So let's build a machine that can be trained to classify data into a couple of outputs. A set of outputs. Anybody know such things? I mean, what's this idea called? It's very popular these days. Yeah? Machine learning. Anybody here to hear this? Hype of the year. OK. And then, I mean, this is actually a very cool idea. I mean, besides the hype that people at, uh, uh, attribute to it, you know, you are making something generic. You can show him a set of inputs and say, according to this input, the output should be this. Train it for a while, and then you can let it go, and it will do it reasonably well. It will do it as well as you. Not bad. Instead of hiring someone, I could, you know, program this thing and train this thing for a few days, and hopefully it will do well. It's not, I mean, it's not like earth shattering. It's not learning learning. It can be trained to classify things. So, you know, you have to have it in perspective. Then there are a couple of algorithms that people developed over the years. Anybody know names of them? Yeah? Convolutional neural networks, exactly. Who likes mathematics? Everybody loves it, right? Okay, I know. And uh, what's the basis of convolutional neural networks? Joke of the day. Okay, that's a very good uh, explanation and uh, much better than I could do. Uh, but the main operation that you're looking at is convolution, right? And if you look at convolution, what is it? You multiply uh, two values, the, the, the value with the, I mean, the point here with the kernel, and you accumulate it on top and you do it over and over, over the entire uh, different features and different inputs, et cetera, et cetera, and you have a connection of them. Maybe in between you do some special things. So this is your uh, idea. You map it to an algorithm, and then maybe you end up writing this in a program. And the program would look something, you know, your colleague was describing that it's a three-dimensional input. So x, y, multiple features. So it goes for i, for j, k, l, m, whatever, five, six dimensions. And you end up doing this multiply, add, accum multiply, accumulate uh, operation a lot. And then from here, maybe you have your compiler. He will compile it to, to whatever architecture you have between. And you will end up with the assembly language that we learned. Uh, this will be instructing the processor to do whatever we want. So I highlighted here one instruction. So this is a load instruction. There is an address here. The, the content of this address is going to be loaded into this register. And then maybe we are going to add something. Maybe we are going to do a conditional jump. So uh, once you have this instruction, this is what you get here, the load instruction. You decode it. You realize I have to read something from the memory. You calculate what address it is. And then this address is written back and comes back to the register. So if you think about it, the instruction supply gave you this load. And then uh, you know that you have to go and find the data. You know where to look for. You put the address. You get it back. So this is as far as we came. Now we are going to make a jump. Uh, we need a lot of data storage here. There has never been a shortage of people wanting to store things. And this is no exception. You have to store a lot of data to be able to do this calculation. You have to store these images. You have to store these coefficients. If you have enough data, maybe for the entire problem, you can solve everything needed inside your computer, inside your processor. And uh, so how do I organize this data? Let's say. Just for the argument's sake, I need 1 million bits for 
for, for this idea for a certain size of this problem. How do I keep my 1 million bits? Any idea? Yeah? OK, we, we say memory, but we want to come to why we make the memory the way it is. You know, we can have 1 million individual bits scattered all around the chip, and they could be accessible anytime to anyone that wants it. That's, that's the ideal thing, right? There is as many bits as you want. Somehow, they magically appear at the point you want to have them. The goal that you are looking for is to try to put as many of these bits as possible. This is the goal when you are trying to design the memory, when you are trying to put these things together. Your first goal is to say, I want to put as much memory as possible. So you want to have, this was one of our goals, you want to have infinite size. The second thing is, although the size is very large, you want it to be very fast. So you want to have uh, zero latency. Or just fast. And maybe you want to also have parallel access to the data. These are your wants. This is, you know, we had our list of things that we wanted. Now we are going back, and we have all these ideas. Uh, if you look, we went into a little bit computer architecture. We know this thing. We went a bit more detail there. We know we are building them from digital circuits. And in a few slides, I'm going to show you that uh, the best possible thing to do is to use a two-dimensional array of these bits. The question is, why? OK, any ideas? Why, why is it, is it two-dimensional? Why not three-dimensional? Or four? Yeah. OK, so just to repeat, we want to group the bits into words, and we only want to access them one word at a time. Is that? Or is it because uh, we can not do it any better? Maybe if we could, we would want to access them not one word at a time, but one array at a time. Would you say no to that? If it was possible? So it's an interesting thing. Why do we stay on these two dimensional things? This is why, and since I like electrical circuits, because Come here, I'm just going to say a few words about the technology. So the way that we are building circuits these days is we take a silicon wafer, so this is the blue part, and on top of that, we are realizing these transistors. In the simplest term, a transistor is a switch. You can turn it on, you can turn it off. If it's turned on, there is current passing through it. It's, if it's turned off, there is no current passing. And these red connections can switch this thing on and off. Simple enough. You can build one transistor um, inside. I mean, so you can form different regions with semiconductors. Uh, in this particular case, this one would be an NMOS transistor. You can build another one close to it. That one will be a PMOS transistor. I mean, it's dual. And both of them combined, NMOS plus PMOS, is what we call complementary metal oxide semiconductor transistor, so CMOS. OK, you're not interested about it, I know. The thing is, uh, these are our active components. We'll be building memories with help of these structures. And these structures, if you realize, are on the surface of the wafer. So the wafer is a two-dimensional structure. Currently, it is, not, uh, it is not easy with this technology to build things which are in three dimensions. I cannot uh, really put additional transistors here and have more density. It doesn't work with, these, with this particular technology. So once you have it on a surface, the best you end up doing is using a two-dimensional array. You can have your transistors, when you look from the top, going this direction, that direction, and then you have a regular structure where you can put a lot. 
So the technology and physics are actually working. Is this the only way for making transistors storing bits? No, it's not. There is a lot of work going in material science, in physics. We are trying to find if we can use different materials for it to make them smaller. We are trying to find if we can store data and bits using magnetic, quantum effects, uh, resistive effects, any kind of thing that you can imagine, we are trying to see if we can do better than that. So far, this has worked very well. There is a law that says something about the development of these transistors. Anybody remember that? Yeah? Moore's law, everybody? Yeah. So as I am talking here, these transistors are getting smaller, right? Next year, these transistors will be 60% smaller. So when I draw this diagram, it will be smaller. Do you know what's getting smaller? We are, when you talk about technologies, when you say, for example, there is a seven nanometer technology, do you know what is seven nanometer usually? It's the length of the gate, it's this dimension. And once you make this dimension smaller and this dimension smaller, the entire thing can shrink, meaning that this array can get more compressed. And what Moore's law says is that every 18 months, two years, we manage to put twice as many transistors into the same area, which seems to be very good because we are shrinking this area. So this is where the things are uh, coming from, why we move into 2D arrays. Ah. Okay, didn't work, don't worry. <laughs> Let's go back to slides. So, how can we store data? So the first thing, we still keep this a little bit in mind, is uh, to store data, we can actually use flip-flops or latches. We saw flip-flops and latches at the beginning when we were looking at sequential uh, structures, when we made finite state machines. Thunderbird blinking, did we name Thunderbird? Thunderbird blinking? The car blinking? What? It's still Thunderbird. Okay. <laughs> so, this is the one that I was talking before, right? You, have, you can put as many flip-flops as you want. Each flip-flop is going to say, uh, store for you one bit. And you can have as many as you want. You can have a million of them inside your circuit. Uh, what's the problem with it? It's very expensive because for one of them, for one flip-flop, we are actually using tens of transistors. Depends on how you're making it. Could be 16, 20, 25, thereabouts of these little transistors have to come together, have to be connected properly so that we can have one bit. And then, you know, for this algorithm, we are going to need, I don't know, 300 million bits. And there's a lot of flip-flops. How do we access them? Well, we have to also somehow organize them. We know that they are very fast. We know that they can, all those bits are accessible at the same time. Now we say, I want more bits. Because for these things, uh, we realize that, okay, there might be a million bits here, but there was already a command. I'm not accessing, I don't need to access all of them at the same time. I might be okay with accessing them word by word. And then we have uh, the second level is what we call static RAM, random access memory. We are calling them random access because we can access any, any value within the array. We will come to that. Uh, static, we are going to explain. They are relatively fast, which is good. They're not as fast as flip-flops. The price we are paying well, we have to pay a price, right? We want larger size, we weren't happy with the flip-flops, and something has to go. And the thing that goes here is that we can only read one data word at a time. We cannot read the entire array, we can only read one part of it at a given time. If we are making this trade-off, we can make them more compact. It's still expensive, one bit costs six transistors, well, from 20 to 6, it's actually a very good, uh, you know, we can put a lot more. In the same area, I'm putting three times as much memory. It's excellent. We are sacrificing a little bit. 
Now, dynamic RAM is your next one. Now, this one looks horrible. It's slower. We can only read one data word at a time, so the same as this. Now, this is really crazy. Reading from this memory destroys the content. Crazy. <laughs> and, well, actually, we are not even talking about that. You, you can write to this memory, and if you don't do something, it will also forget. It's also not the smartest memory in the world. You know, you have to remind him. You know, you say, my name is right. My name is Frank. Frank. What was my name again? What was it? Frank. So every, every 50 milliseconds, you have to say, my name is Frank. My, don't forget, my name is Frank. That's the only way this guy works. But it's a horrible memory. You will have to agree. It's really one of the stupidest memories you can think about. But we like it because it is cheap. Now look at this thing. We sacrifice parallel access. We sacrifice fast. We sacrifice latency. Why? Because for us, the number of bits is more important than anything else. We can store one bit by only one transistor and something called a capacitor that nobody even cares to describe about. So, 26, 1, and there are other technologies, storage technologies. Uh, flash, much, much slower. Access takes a long time. There's something very good. It's not volatile, so you know, it doesn't need to be plugged into uh, to, to a power supply. Uh, magnetic disks are the same way. Uh, our RAMs are the same way. Magnetic RAMs are the same way. It's very cheap, mainly because you don't even use a single transistor to store those bits. They are stored somehow magically uh, in, in the material. You need some way to accessing and reading them. So, these are the ways that we are going to use, and you will realize when you go back to this thing, the register files inside the processor, you wrote the code of a register file, or you've seen it. When you synthesize it, these things end up being please <laughs> flip-flops. Because it's a very small memory, 32 times 32. You can actually manage to do it out of flip-flops. You can have multiple accesses. You can have two, three registers accessed at the same time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because it's not so big, you don't care that per bit we are using more. For these ones, we will not be able to afford for a larger uh, capacity these things. Okay. So I told you already that we uh, want to store data efficiently. I was talking about the way these transistors end up uh, manufacturing, and this is why we end up using these array structures where whatever collection of transistors are, you know, six, uh, one, zero, whatever, they are all organized in this array. And it's actually a simplified way. So you provide an address, and this array stores two to the n uh, words, each of m bits. Sounds like a good plan. And uh, so the array stores the data. There is, the data is organized in, in certain bits, 32 bits, 64 bits, 17 bits, why not? There are always some rebels. Uh, there is some way to, you know, from this address, that allows you to go into the array and select whatever data is there. And then we need to have some circuitry that reads this thing out. So the good news is, if you organize it this way, at every address, so there are two to the n unique addresses, uh, you can write an m bit value and read one, access one, anytime you like. Uh, the compromise we are making is, you can access the entirety of the array. All the bits, all uh, 2 to the n times m bits inside this array can be accessed. No limitations. The only thing that is, I can only ex uh, access m bits at a time. If this is an acceptable uh, compromise, then we can compress things uh, 
when we have this excess restriction, when we are okay with this, we can have a more compact organization of the memory, and this is why we are uh, doing it this way. So uh, here is some uh, numerical example. So this is from the book. I mean, it's a very kiddie memory, right? I have two addresses, uh, two address bits. With two bits, I can have four different values. So it could be either 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And I have a grand total of three bits per address. Yay. And I can store at every address location, I can store three bits. Uh, this is a kiddie uh, problem, obviously. And, uh, but you can work out the numbers really easily. So you have two to the two different addresses, three bit array. You have number of words four, word size three bits. So you can calculate that you have 12 bits that's stored in the array. More realistic values are probably something like this. It's not even a very large one. So 1,024 bits, 32-bit uh, array. So you have 1,000 4-byte values stored into this, 4 kilobytes. Who has a memory uh, with 4 kilobytes? What's the memory you have in your computer? Anyone? Someone? Yeah? How much? 16. 16 gigabytes. So this is 4 kilobytes. A thousand times would be 4 megabytes. A million times of that would be 4 gigabytes. And uh, we still have to have 4 times of that. So we are about 4 million times less than your memory at the moment. But it's a good start, you know. We were at 12 bits. Now, how does this operation go? Remember our addresses, so we had two-bit addresses, and we have this array that I have already here, and each one of these somehow magically stores one bit. And now what we will do is forget all the combinational logic discussions we had. We will say, I will activate one of these rows at a given time. And I will connect the output of everything in the row to one of the, out, to, to, to the output. So if I uh, uh, supply an address, let's say address one, zero, there are four possible rows, and I'm activating this row. And I'm telling these guys, hello, it's your turn, please, send whatever you have to the output. So this guy says, aha, uh -huh, it's my turn. I don't care what's written here. I am connected. I am sending my output to data two. This guy says, hey, I am connected. I have stored bit zero. I am putting this out. And this guy is also stored zero. So to the address one zero, I have magically connected the, uh, uh, the content of this entire row so that I have uh, received my output. In a nutshell, this is how the memory array works. Good so far? A few details are going to come, hopefully. Now, notice that I, I didn't really talk about what's in here. We just said that they are storing. We know that it could be a flip-flop, it could be a latch, it could be a DRAM, SRAM, something, something. And uh, the important thing is we have something to store the bit. In a DRAM, we said that we are actually using a capacitor. So the value is stored on a capacitor. We're going to come to that in a second. And in an SRAM, the value is stored in these back-to-back -back connected inverter. So if there's zero here, there's one here. If there's one here, there's zero here. They are in agreement. They stay that way. But somehow, I mean, it's OK to store the value, but whenever I want to access the word line, I want to access this row, I need to activate and connect the content so that I can share it and read it out. So I need some way of accessing it. And in this case, here you have an access transistor that when I activate it, will connect this point to this point. So whatever voltage is here will be shared over. The same thing happens here. So this is what keeps the value. And these two guys, left and right, will connect the content of this thing 
to the rest of the array so that it can go out. So if you are building an even larger memory, remember we were going to 16 gigabytes or 30, 32 gigabytes, 4 gigabytes, whatever. The arrays that we are building were relatively minor. Now we may need to tweak it a little bit, and this happens uh, when you want to build a larger memory, you have to pay a price. The larger memories become slower. So if you are going in size, you become slower. It's annoying. I want to have a lot of bits. I know how to pack them, but the larger I grow, the uh, slower it becomes. And uh, it's not nice, no? So how can I go to 16 gigabytes of memory without being very slow? So one idea is you say, I will divide the memory into different banks, and I will say this is one memory bank, this is another memory bank, this is another memory bank. I will have them in parallel, and I will access them one at a time. So large memories, actually, the things that are in your computer, are actually hierarchical array, array structures that are, uh, there are multiple arrays in parallel activated one by one. So if you go into a DRAM, modern DRAM, you will see that a DRAM is divided into channels, the channel is divided into ranks, the ranks are divided into banks, the banks are divided into subarrays, subarrays into mats, and those mats are about the size that you were talking about, uh, the 1,000 times uh, 32 or 512 times something, something. Um, but it's not so easy, right? So once you have distributed your memory around this thing, how do you find an efficient way of uh, distributing your data all over this hierarchy? Where does the first element of your array go and where does the second element of your array go? So your goal actually in designing it is to find the latency of the memory array access and uh, allow multiple accesses as much as possible and you want to somehow uh, divide the large array into independent banks that can be accessed in parallel. This can be done, and there is a um, lot of uh, work going on in trying to divide the memory hierarchy so that you get the max, uh, you reduce your latency. Latency is the amount of time that you can access it as much as possible by arranging the hierarchy. It's an uh, interesting subject how we can do this. And... Uh, we are going to, uh, in, in the later uh, years, you are going to see much more about this. Now we have to briefly talk about this DRAM versus SRAM. I see that I have only two minutes, so let's just try to manage DRAM first. And after the break, we will do SRAM. So, um, This is actually your DRAM. It's actually the simplest electrical thing you can imagine is actually a capacitor connected to the ground, and the capacitor stores charge. Charge are electrons. So if you somehow manage to bring the electrons, uh, they cannot, the current cannot go on. They, you see these two parallel plates. The electrons are like, oh, there's a traffic accident. They get stuck there, and they are, you know, accumulating on these sides of the... And because they are negatively charged, they will uh, induce an electric field across, and the, the charge will be stored in this capacitor. So if you had a switch, you connected a large voltage, you charge this capacitor up, so whatever voltage you had here, let's say one volt, would be transferred over here slowly. There is a time constant to do this. And once this is charged, you would have one volt of potential difference across these plates. And then you can remove this, this charge, this uh, voltage source. And where should the electrons go? They stay here. And later on, you can connect to it again and see if there is any charge left on the capacitor. If all the electrons are still there, that means that we have charge 
Or on the other way, if you hadn't stored anything there, there would be no charge and you can have two distinct cases. Now the idea is very, very simple. And it works also very well. Just give me a minute. And uh, we need one access transistor. This is a transistor that is uh, allowing connecting it to the bit line and saying, yes, I am accessing it not. There are two problems with this. This poor guy, let me just draw it the other way around so that it matches. There you go. No, 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 no. So it's here. Yeah. There are two problems with it. These things are not ideal. The capacitors are not ideal. Because the capacitors are not ideal, some of the electrons are leaking through here. Some of them are also leaking through this switch because this transistor, as much as we tell that it's an ideal switch, it's not really ideal. Uh, there are some little drops where the current can go through. So it is possible that this, the current on top of this capacitor will decay slowly. This is why we call it dynamic. We can store it, we can keep the charge, but after a time, the charge shield will erode and slowly disappear. And when this does, before this does, we have to read out the content and write it back again to refresh it. This is the issue with the, um, uh, with the uh, capacitor. So the cell loses charge over time due to different leakage paths. So one of them goes from the top plate to the bottom plate. The other one goes through the transistor. And then we need to refresh the cell. Um, if you want to make, if you want to put a lot of um, memory, what do you think do you want to do with the capacitor? What's the thing that you try to minimize here? Size. You want to make it as small as possible. What's the problem with making it small? Well, the, the, it, yeah, the leakage will probably stay the same, but that leakage will uh, discharge the capacitor much faster than a larger one. Yes, there are less electrons stored. So there is a, a thing between the density and uh, uh, you want to make them as small as possible, but if you make them small, they cannot keep the charge for a very long time. So this is what you are fighting for. There is also the... One more minute? No, okay, let's have a break. Okay, we are back. We are back, we are back, we are back. Okay. So there was this one more story that I wanted to tell you about the DRAM, and it also partially explains uh, the dilemma that we have with the size and the uh, speed. And I... Um, my analogies are always hit and miss, so bear with me. In the end, we can make a voting if it worked or not, okay? Okay? You're going to grade the analogy. If you give thumbs down at the end, I'm never going to use it again. So that's something. <laughs> okay. So uh, we are talking, I, I always say this, the big memories are slower uh, the, the larger we make, the things get slower and, and things and things and things. And then we wanted to say, hey, if I want to make this memory small, I want to make the capacitor as small as possible. And then we were talking that there is more leakage and things like that. So how does this work in a little bit more detail? So what happens is actually you have this one common line that I am connecting to with the access transistor. And there are, you know, thousands of them connected so there is one capacitor here, there is one capacitor here, there is one capacitor here, one capacitor here. And this is like a long line. Compared to the tiny, tiny size of the transistor, this is really a long line. And how do I actually make the measurement? How do I read something out? Right? So if you think about it, there is also an amplifier here. We are not going to go too much into electrical engineering. I'm going to revert to zoology for one part of this. Um, 
There is a lot of capacitance just because this is a big line. It runs, compared to the size of this, it's a very uh, larger capacitance. There is some voltage on this capacitance. And the moment I connect this part, these little electrons that were inside, the electrons that were hiding here, they start going over to here. And there was already some charge, this is very big, and they are, this is a pool of big capacitance, and this guy is making a small change. If there is no charge, some charge of here goes into here. If there is charge, this charge adds up on top of that. Now, what does that have to do with the size? So um, I like going to the zoo, I like zoos a lot. And there's a, there are funny stories that the uh, veterinarians there tell. How do you, for example, measure how much a hippo weighs, a hippopotamus? It's like four tons the animal. Do you know what they do? Anybody? <laughs> that's, that's a good explanation. It is what they do sometimes. Uh, but the, the thing is, you cannot put a hippo anywhere you want. They are not very kind animals. They don't like to be pushed around, and they weigh like two cars. So they usually like to bait, and there is a pool. You measure the height of the pool without the hippo, and then once the hippo decides to jump into the pool, what happens is the water level rises. So then you mark that change, and you say, okay, there was a hippo in the pool. It's a one, okay? So the water level rises enough. Now, this would correspond to a big capacitor. This big capacitor goes to this line, makes a huge change, and you immediately realize it. And now, let's imagine that we want, I mean, in this room, how many hippos can I have in this room? Looking around. Who has not seen a hippo? <laughs> it's, a, it's a big animal. It's really big. So you can fit maybe 40 of them in this room. And it's not much, you know, 40 bits in this room. How can we improve this? We can make the animals smaller, tinier things. So if you, if, you, if you shrink it, bear with me for a second. If you shrink it to the size of a mosquito, for example, the same thing still could work. You could have like one tiny mosquito and, you know, it jumps into the pool. And because of its weight, the pool is slightly going to rise. It's very difficult to measure that change. Do you see that point? But now in this room, I could have a billion mosquitoes. So the basic charge is good. But the change that you bring would require you to make a very long and very precise measurement. It's not very easy to say, a mosquito just jumped into the swimming pool. <coughs> it is possible, though. I mean, you know, it will take a lot of, uh, you know, you have to take... A, a, and this is what actually happens. The larger you make this thing, a smaller charge is being shared on this line. If there is only six connections or eight connections here, the effect of connecting one of these bits, one of these capacitors is much easier recognizable than when you have uh, 128,000 of them and only one tiny, tiny capacitor connects. So this is the one the story I wanted to tell. So how about it? Who says thumbs up? Oh, you're very kind. Who says <laughs> horrible? <laughs> no, you're not. It's not easy to say horrible, right? We are giving grades to you. Okay. So this was about the uh, DRAM cells. And uh, what about the SRAM cell? Well, the one that we don't like about DRAM is that the, um, the, the current is leaking, uh, it is losing its charge and things like that. The static RAMs, random access memories, have this reinforcing behavior. It's like two friends talking to each other. I think the lecture is horrible. Yeah, the lecture is horrible. Yeah, yeah, it's really bad. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So, you know, there is a zero here, there's a one here, one here, a zero here, and they both agree on this value, and they are both amplifying this. So if this guy is slightly changing his mind, he's just, you know, keeping him in line. 
We call them static because as long as there is current, as long as these are plugged into supply, uh, these uh, inverters will not change their value. They are bistable. That means that if, if this for some reason changes from zero to one, it has two stable states. Either you have one here, zero here, or you have zero here and one here. Both are okay, but once it is there, it stays there. So this is the good thing. So there is a feedback path, positive, you know, it's a reinforcing behavior that keeps it there. So if you want to access it, you have to somehow uh, add this um, connection and connect to the bit lines. The way it works is actually you have here the true value, and here you have the complemented value, which makes detection a little bit faster. So one goes up a little bit, the other one goes down a little bit, and you can still uh, notice. Now, about these inverters, the larger transistors you have, so these are our transistors, if you make them larger, more current can flow, meaning that they are stronger. That makes them larger. You want to make these as small as possible. Why? Because you want to stick them into an array and put as many of them as possible because we care about the size. Then you again have like these tiny, tiny transistors connected to a large array and trying to make their voice heard. Hello, everyone. You know, barely hear that guy. Do you, so somebody asked me last year a question. So if this guy is zero, this guy is one, how do you overwrite this thing? Do you know this one? Anyone wonder? No, okay. It will remain a mystery. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to this thing. Memory bank organization and uh, operation. So the goal is now we have a 2D storage array. We organize them in arrays. They could be SRAMs, they could be DRAMs. The content of them is not so important. We realize that at any given time, we should activate only one of these roles. So once you have your address, we store this address and we have to decode it so that only one row at a given time is active. So this is the job of the row decoder. What's the column decoder? Now, remember the previous one where we are putting the array, it was 1032 by 1024 by 32. If you are looking at an array kind of structure, it's a kind of a bad organization. I mean, I'll try to draw it, it looks like this, right? 1,024 times 32. No, I mean, it's not a very ideal thing. So you say, instead of doing this, I could cut it here and make two of them side by side, or I could cut it and make four of them side by side, so that I come to a more uh, geometrically um, better uh, organization of the memories. Because here you have a very long line. This was the line that was bothering us. Here it's half as long, here's one fourth as long. So instead of storing only 32 bits here, I can store 64, 128, 256. And then once I read the entire row, the, the part that I'm looking for is not this entire row, but it's only one part of it. So I have another multiplexer, a column decoder, that I say, you know, I read this entire row, I only want 32 bits out of it, I read 256, and I'm going to select one eighth of it. So either I take this one, this one, this one, this one. It's, it's an organizational issue. And if you look at the thing, uh, what we have to do, once we uh, want to read it, we have to decode the uh, address, and we have to drive the row lines. Then, the selected bits in the row are driving these lines. In this case, we want to access only that part of the memory. And uh, then the next thing is we need to amplify this thing that's like, you know, detecting the mosquito. And then uh, the value comes here, and then we have to select out of all this vector that we read. We are just selecting this part and giving to the output. And... Uh, yeah, this is more or less what we are doing. Questions? Yes. Uh, so this is based on the interim and the 
Yes, but with some slight details hidden for making it simple. It's not, it's, it's an overhead, but yes, when you read the DRAM, let me just go, I think the, uh, uh, with the DRAM, while you are reading it, you are writing it back at the same time. You also enable a write, but let's keep the detail a little bit. Am I stalling? Okay. Okay. This is actually the same. Uh, this is the thing, uh, now maybe this answers the question just on the slides. With the DRAM, you have, uh, you have this issue once again. The bit cell array has these, uh, um, has these uh, capacitors and they are losing their charges over time. And it loses charge over time, it loses charge when read. So you have to do two things. You have to, uh, the read sequence is exactly the same, but in addition, uh, while you are reading it, you not only read it, but you amplify the signal and write it back to the same row that was already activated. And additional, additionally, because you are losing your charge over time, even if you have no intention of reading anything, periodically, you have to read every memory location in the DRAM read out the value and write it back. That's called the refresh cycle and it's, uh, it's in the tens of milliseconds. So all your computers, even if you're doing nothing, are continuously reading and writing the values back. And uh, they are trying to schedule it so that they are not interfering uh, with your normal operation. Okay, so.